Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand together. We have a, a praise report and several, several prayer requests uh, to start with tonight. Brother Ed Duke went to the doctor today and uh, got a tremendous report. Um, his white blood cell count is, is way up. The scan that they did showed that the cancer is reduced by a third and in some areas 60%. So we're so thankful and um, know this is just the beginning. Believe in God for that. Let's continue to pray for the Griggs. She is going home tonight, but pray for them. Pray for Lisa Wilson. Pray for Jackie Johnson. And um, if Brother Chandler and Sister Hannah will come forward, I want us to have special prayer for them uh, tonight. Um, ministers, elders, ladies, if you would want to come around, um, this would be uh, definitely appropriate. So, Sister Hannah uh, is expecting, but they went to the doctor yesterday, and um, there are some severe complications with the baby. God is well able. I believe God is going to correct this tonight. We're doing what the Word of God says. We're calling for the elders of the church. Matter of fact, we're calling for the whole church. And we're believing God for healing for Sister Hannah, for the baby tonight. In Jesus' name. Let's give God praise for hearing and answering our prayers right now. Thank you, Lord. Gentlemen, if you'd take a little time and love on Brother Chandler, ladies, take a little time and love on Sister Hannah. That's totally appropriate. Love this sweet couple. Hallelujah.
pray for every other need that we've mentioned. God, I thank you for a positive report for Brother Ed today. But God, we're praying for complete healing, complete healing for Lisa Wilson and Jackie Johnson. And God, I pray for Sister Griggs and Brother Griggs. God, be be their strength, be their, their, their help. God, I thank you, Lord. You're so awesome to us. God, every need that we bring to you, we know that you are able to supply every need. God, and you're not only the healer, you're, but you're the comforter. Uh, the Holy Ghost is a comforter, God. And, and God, in moments like this, we need you to heal, but we also need you to comfort us, God. You're, you're the peace that passes all understanding. You're the peace, uh, the Prince of Peace, God. And we give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, in your own way, why don't you just magnify him? magnify the Lord in this room right now. I thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you for your love and for the love of the body, God. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. You may be seated. Let's worship together. Let him turn it in your face. Watch him work it for your good. not done with what he started he's not done until it's good watch him turn it in your face watch him work it for your good not done with what he started he's not done until it's good hello peace hello joy hello Hello peace, hello peace, hello, peace. hello, hello joy. joy, hello love, hello strength, hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon. Sing hello peace, hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello. 
It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon. Fear is not my future. You are. If you believe that right now, can you raise your voice? Sickness, Sickness is not it's my not story. story. You, you are, are Jesus. You are. Heartbreak's not my home. You are. You are. Death is not the end. You are. You are. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello. right now I thank you almighty God I thank you almighty God hallelujah as the ushers are coming thank you for being here tonight remember uh, family month is right around the corner uh, you can dress casually we're going to have a dedicated uh, teaching series on mental health it's going to be a great great time we've got several events that'll be taking place the first one is july the 7th it's our celebration of freedom sunday invite your friends invite everybody to be here um it's kind of like our friends day and so we want to get friends here we'll have a barbecue meal afterwards it's going to be a great time uh, and looking forward to what god is going to do during that that time period god i thank you for sweet people that love and serve you god i thank you that when our heart when our hearts are overwhelmed we ask you to lead us to the rock that's higher than I. God, and tonight we thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, we do our very best to reflect that, and we do that not just in giving, but by the way we live our lives. God, and you are always so faithful to us, God. We give tonight in reflection of your faithfulness. We give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. When you've had an opportunity to give, you may be seated. The announcements will scroll during this next song. Song forever to the land. 
you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the land we'll sing your song forever and amen and the angels cry holy all creation cries seated. A few weeks ago, Brother Dunson spoke to us about multicultural ministry and did such a phenomenal job. He had presented that at camp meeting, and when I heard it, I'm like, faith needs to hear that. And also on that same day, Brother Jeff Robertson talked about outreach, and I also felt like we need to hear what he had to say. So put your hands together. Welcome Brother Jeff as he comes to, to speak to us tonight about our purpose, our passion, and our cause. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Yes. Amen. You know, I spoke, a, mentioned a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago about, I believe that, you know, as saints of God, we should be divinely placed to where God wants us and needs us. We shouldn't go to a congregation and look for what suits us or look to see how pretty it looks or, you know, exactly how things, you know, suit us. But we need to be to know whether God has placed us there. And uh, as Pastor said last year at camp meeting, I was asked to speak on the subject of outreach and church planting. And I have been involved in both of those. So just to let you know, I'm not the guru of outreach or church planting. There is no right or wrong way to do it as long as it gets done. Amen. But I do have some things that I feel like will help us. And I, I just think it's interesting. I said all that about, about being divinely placed. 
when I came to faith and I sat down and I met with pastor, he told me his vision of planting 25 churches. That don't happen overnight. It don't happen without the hands of the man working. And I began to think about that, and I said, Lord, if this, if this is where you want me, this is where I'll go. So, Brother Arch has been involved in the same thing. So, I believe God brings people together for a reason, for a purpose. I believe before we see the other side of glory, those 25 churches are going to be planted in the Memphis proper. And I believe you're going to be a part of that. Every one of us sitting right here is going to be a part of that. And as Christians, our directive as servants of the kingdom, I took from Luke 14, 23, and the Lord said unto the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come, and that my house may be full. It's not only about bringing them in so we can see the numbers in the house. There's a whole lot more to it than that. That's just the, the, the blessing or the icing on the cake when we begin to see the, the pews filled. The whole purpose is for us to reach someone and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and lead them to be the, to be the bridge that, that leads them from where they are to the plan of salvation. So there are a few things that I believe that will help us do that. Church planning and, and, and outreach is all about people. It's all about reaching people. There are people all around us that we encounter every single day that are hungry, and they're searching. If you have a moment to start, begin to talk to anyone in, on the streets of Memphis, Germantown, Collier, wherever, if you could get in a serious conversation with them, you will learn that everybody is searching for something. They're hungry for something. And the day and age that we live in, it's all about being accepted and being loved. So there's three, three keys that I personally feel like are important for us to have sort of a grasp on in order for us to outreach people and to plant churches. Number one is knowing the will of God. Knowing the will of God. When I mean, what I mean by that is you don't just go and say, oh, I think that's where I want to start planting a church, or I, I think that might be a good area, or it might not be a good area, so I'm not going to go there. We need to spend some time with our face in the altar beginning to talk to the Lord and say, God, you send me. You send me where I need to be. And there is a permissive will of God and there is a perfect will of God. When you're witnessing to people, God's not going to deny or, you know, deny your efforts and what you're doing. And he will definitely save those that you witness to just because you're being a part of the, the, his, ser his service and you're reaching for people. That's what I'm talking about. But when we're talking about church planning and we're talking about reaching out to the people, when we plan a church, we need to be looking at the area around it because that's the, the community that you're going to be reaching. It's hard to get people to drive for a great distance just to come to a church, especially a new church plant. So we have to know the area where we're at. We have to know the demographic of what we're working with and, and exactly what, what is around that, that particular spot. But knowing it's the will of God is the imperative thing that we must act upon. I, I may have said this before a few years back when we started a church over here off of Mount Moriah and we began to search for a place. We looked and looked and looked and looked uh, either it had just been rented or it was too expensive. There was all of these different things. But this little storefront building came available. And when we walked over to that place and they unlocked the door, I, I, I'm telling you, it's just, it was a feeling of just like a rushing mighty wind when that door opened. And it was like the Holy Ghost said, this is it. And from that moment on, I had no doubt that that was the will of God where we were supposed to be. We went in there, and in a matter of weeks, the doors were, everything was painted and everything was ready to go, and, and the people began to come. We had people just begin to come across. There was an apartment complex across the road. 
They just begin to come because we put a church sign up. They wanted to know what it was about. There was people that was hungry. There was people that were looking for something. They were searching for something. And they wanted to see if we just might have what they were looking for. So being in the perfect will of God is imperative. And when we talk about planting churches, now there should be a church on every street corner in the city of Memphis, Apostolic Church. Let me say that because there's plenty of churches. We need to be, have churches that are teaching and preaching the truth and are spreading this gospel and reaching the lost. So knowing the will of God is, is number one. Number two is loving people. Loving people. If we can't love people, we cannot reach them. And it's hard to express love to someone if you don't love them. I'm telling you. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't show my wife how much I loved her if I didn't truly love her. It would be very hard to do. And people need to know. They want to know. They're looking for someone to love them for who they are. Don't try to change me. I want to know if you really walk the walk that you're talking. I want to know if you're really what you say you are. And let me tell you, they will test you on those levels. We have to love them at their best and at their worst. If people feel loved and cared for, they will follow you. Sister Arch, put up that first picture if you would. I remember about, it was 2000, somewhere around April of 2013, I got a call one night about 11.30 at night. This man here in the middle called me, got my number from somebody that he knew, and he called me. He had just gotten off of work at FedEx, and he said, Jeff, I need to talk to you. He said, this is Lenny. And I was like, I hadn't probably talked to him in 15 years. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, what, what you got? He said, no. I need to talk to you. I said, okay, tell me more. He said, look, I just got off of work. I need to meet with you. I need to talk to you. I said, okay, where are you? Where are you? I just got off of work at FedEx. I said, okay, meet me at IHOP. So at 12 o'clock at night, I go meet this man at IHOP, and he began to tell me how his world began to turn upside down. He began to tell me the problems that he had been dealing with in his life, the, the divorce that he was facing, and all the things that was going on in his life, and he just began to weep. Now, this is a big old boy right here. You can't see that. He's about 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and about 380, 390 pounds. He's a big old boy. But he was sitting there just weeping and crying. And I said, let me tell you something that you need that's going to help you with this situation. Now, let me tell you something about this, the backstory on this man. When he got married to his wife, I don't know how long they've been married. I just couldn't remember that. One of the things he said was, in this ceremony, I don't want God mentioned. You're not going to tell me that we're doing this through God, through, I don't want anything about the Bible. I don't want any of that, anything like that mentioned. And the preacher said, well, I'm not the guy to do this. I'm not the one to do this. But when he called me that night, he had gotten to a place where he was looking for something. I'm not going to try to spend too much time here, but I need to set the foundation. So we're talking about loving people. But he had gotten to that place of desperation, and he was looking for something. And I began to talk to him about the Lord, and I began to talk to him about God, how, could, how God could make changes in his life. And if he began to trust God, that God could make these provisions, and this could happen, and this could happen. And we talked till probably 2 or 3 in the morning. I don't remember, but it was way over in the morning. And I said, Lenny, if you really want to show God that you're serious and you need help, why don't you come to church Sunday? I think it was on Thursday night. Sunday he was there. And I mean, he was a broken man. He was broken. He was desperate for something. I didn't try to win him over to the Lord at that moment. I didn't try to tell him what it took to be saved. I didn't try to, uh, uh, to tell him how wrong he was or how he had lived his life wrong and this and that. But what I learned from him that he, his family, and it's a big family, had lived through so much hurt in their growing up years. His mom was disabled and she was a Christian. She considered herself a Christian, but she got 
wrapped up in these televangelists and began to send every dime she had just about of these televangelists. They lived in poverty because her, their mother was sending so much money to preachers. He, his sisters, his brother, they hated the church. They didn't want to hear anything about God. They didn't want to know anything about a preacher. They hated anything to do with the Lord because of the way they were raised. But there came that, that moment to where he became so hungry and desperate that he was willing to try something different. Brought him into the church and we begin to work with him and begin to pray with him and just begin to have dinner with him and have to, you know, sit down with him. I'd drive by his house and sit on the front porch and we'd just talk. I tried to show him that we loved him, that he meant something to us. He came to church for a couple months, praying in the altar, never received the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name, never received the Holy Ghost that I know of, but he was faithful. God began to do some things in his life even though he hadn't received the Holy Ghost. His divorce happened, yes, but he wound up getting 50% custody of his children. His job situation changed. He got a much better job. He was able to work in the daytime, be at home at night with his kids when they got out of school. Just things began to change in his life that he felt like there was no way it could ever happen. But as I begin to express to him through his needs, if he will trust in the Lord, we're going to love you as much as we can love you, but there's no love like God can love you. And he began to see things in his life change. And he has a sister. And he began to talk to his sister. And he began to tell her, try to get her to come to church. And she was the same way. Uh -uh, ain't happening. Ain't, you know, no part of it. The family was just, just broken. They were hurt. Put up the next picture if you would. This is his precious sister. Her name is Jeannie. I'd go by there and she'd be sitting on the front porch smoking a cigarette and she'd hear me and him talking about the Lord and I'd be talking about his life situation and how God could do things for him. And she wouldn't say nothing, but I could tell she was listening. So after about the second trip over, I said, Jeannie, we need to get a Bible study. Oh, no, we do not. You don't even need to be talking to me about no Bible study. She said, I'm going to tell you now, I ain't coming to that church either. Lenny's been trying to get me to come over there. I ain't coming. I don't want no part of it. But I kept going back. We kept talking about the Lord. We kept talking about how things could change and what he was seeing change and what the church was doing for him and kept on. It wasn't long. And Lenny came up and he said, hey, Gene watched the service on Sunday online. I was like, oh, did she? Yeah. Went back over that week and said, Jeannie, I wanted that Bible study. Nope, ain't happening. Ain't happening. I persisted. After about six weeks, she finally said, I'll come to church one time. But I'm not staying the whole time. Just to shut you up, I'll come one time. Well, I want to tell you something. When she came that one time, the Holy Ghost got a hold of her. Something happened to her that she didn't know what happened. She got up and tried to walk out, and it was waiting for her in the car. She tried to crank the car and had to get up and come back inside. She said, I couldn't even start the car. Something's wrong here. What have y'all done? Something is wrong here. And I said, Jeannie, it's just the presence of the Lord. You're not, you're not used to that. I said, I need to teach you a Bible study. Nope, I ain't done it. Next Sunday, she came back. Had my time with Lenny throughout the week. She was sitting around listening. Next Sunday, she came back. A few weeks went on, and every time I saw her, I said, Jeannie, I want that Bible study. Finally, one day, she said, okay, I'll let you teach me a Bible study if it'll get you off of my back. I said, it will. So she worked night for Comcast. Comcast. She got off at 11 o'clock at night. I said, all right, on Tuesday nights, we're going to meet at IHOP, and we're going to have a Bible study. So we'd meet at 11.30 on Tuesday nights for Bible study. We begin to meet as we begin to talk about the Lord, and I begin to teach her search for truth. The Word began to grip her. Something began to happen. She began, she began to come to church early. She began to stay late in fellowship. She began to talk to other people throughout the church. She wanted to get to know people. This went on. Then the Bible study began. She began to bring one of her daughters. Then she began to bring her son. Then she began to bring her son-in-law. Finally, we got to the point to where we had to change Bible study from IHOP. We just started having it at church. 
Search for Truth is a 12-week Bible study. I taught her 19 months that it take me to see, teach her Search for Truth. 19 months. There were some nights she would come in and there would be so much weight of the world on her. I'd open the Bible and she said, you can close that Bible. I don't need to know anything you got to say tonight. I need you to pray for me. And we'd have an all night prayer meeting. But I want to tell you, there was something about those interactions that she realized that there really is somebody out there that loves me, that cares for me. It doesn't matter where I live. It doesn't matter how much money I do not have. It doesn't matter what part of town I'm from. There's people out there that really do care. We spent 19 months teaching that Bible study. Go to the next picture. I baptized Jeannie in, in Jesus' name. She was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is that big family. All but four of them were baptized in Jesus' name except for the babies. Five of them received the gift of the Holy Ghost through that one Bible study, through that one 11 o'clock meeting at night, and all we had to do was just let somebody know that we love them. Loving people is not about walking by and say, I love you. It's about showing them. The old, the old saying is, actions speak louder than words. When you get out here on the streets and you begin to witness to somebody and you begin to reach for them and you want to you tell them about Jesus, they're going to want to know for sure that you really mean what you say. They want you to show them that you love them, that they are worth your time and they're worth you coming back time after time. They will try you, I promise you. But loving people is how we win them. John 13, 34, and a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my, my disciples. If you love, have one, love one to another. This world needs somebody to love them. There are so many families that are being walking, that are walking the streets today that have been just ravaged in their life through hatred and, and through disappointment and, and through broken marriages and through broken homes and they feel like they, they don't matter to anybody. But the church needs to walk out and look at them in their face and say, we love you and we're willing to show you that we love you and we have something for you that will help you make it to, to the next day. It's not what I can give you as far as monetary or, or, or material, but it's the Word of God and it's the Spirit of God that I can lead you to and I can be a bridge and that will then a pathway to that I can get you to that point of salvation. We started that church in 2013. By the middle of 2014, we was running 80, 90, 86 percent of those people, three families that were not that were apostolic. 86% of those people had never been to church before. It's people off the street. Once it gets in your blood, once, once you start seeing results from it, it's like you can't stop it. I don't know if you've ever been a part of Bible studies or if you've ever been a part of, of outreach, not going and knocking doors. Those days are gone. You get shot now if you go knocking on somebody's door. But showing people that you love them. And when they begin to feel that expression and they begin to understand that there's really something about what you're telling them, it just begins to energize you and charge you to where you just can't stop it, it seems. Every time you turn the corner, you're looking for somebody that you can, you can talk to and somebody that you can just say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus or, or do you know Jesus or have you had an experience with Jesus? That's okay if you hadn't. Let me tell you about him. We have to show them that we love them. That's a big family. We were averaging 16, 18, and 20 in Bible study on Thursday nights. As Jeannie began to come to church, then she was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. She couldn't come to church a lot of times on Sunday because she had to work every other weekend on Sunday. Then they changed her. Let me tell you how the devil works. Not two weeks, three weeks after she received the Holy Ghost, her shift changed. They put her on Wednesday night third shift instead of Tuesday night third shift. She came to me and said, what do I do? I said, you need to go talk to the Lord. So what do I say? I said, tell him what you want. She said, well, let me tell you. I said, no, you tell him and I'll be right here with you and we'll agree on it. 
And she said, God, if it's your will, you'll change my schedule to where I cannot miss church. Thursday night Bible study. Friday morning she went in, her boss said, I need to see you. We've got some changes that we're doing. Next week is starting Monday. You're going to be on day shift, Monday through Friday, no weekends. When you talk to the Lord, he's listening. People are doing the same thing to what you say. Now, I could have told them, people, oh, I love you. Now, it just it didn't wasn't just me. Now, it was a group of us apostolics in this, this congregation. I don't think it's, I'm taking all the credit for this because I'm not. It was all God. But there was, there was opportunities that I could have said, you know what? I'm tired. I'm not going to Bible study tonight. I worked a full-time job too, you know. And I knew Bible study, when I meet at 1130, it's going to run to 1, 2, 3 o'clock. And I still got to go to work the next day. There were times that that would have been easy. But I was persistent. And I told the Lord, I said, God, I, because of you and the unction that you give me, begin to seek these people out after I had the opportunity. Now, you've got to give me strength. I'm telling you, I, I, there was three or four nights a week I didn't get into bed to three or four o'clock in the morning. Didn't bother me. I'd go right to work and never think nothing about it. I don't know. God just will work things out in our favor if we lean on him. And finding somebody to, to, to uh, uh, witness to, just ask him. Sister Ginger and Sister Shari are Bible study fiends. They are our Bible study program here at Faith, in case y'all didn't know. It won't be long till they'll have to go to a different school because they'll have taught everybody at South Haven Elementary a Bible study. They are wearing those, those ladies out up there. But I'm going to tell you something. You know, the Bible said, the Scripture said, Paul planted Apollos water, but God gives the increase. There's some seed being planted and some lives that I'm telling you these ladies are, are reaching. Oh, they may not be the ones to see what happens there. But I'm telling you now, I believe with everything in my, in my, every fiber of my being that God sees the efforts. God sees what's going on. He sees that there's somebody out here trying to, to reach his people that are longing for something. And he's going to begin to work in some lives. Whether we see it or whether we don't, trust in him and believe that he's doing it. And I guess I've, point number three is home Bible studies. And I've kind of brought that in together with point number two. But you build a church by Bible studies, don't you, Brother Arch? That man was in Kendallville for 27 years. His congregation grew and grew and grew and grew and grew because they were teaching Bible studies. Year after year, they kept teaching Bible studies. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. They are looking for something, and that word is what they need. You know, I look at preachers a lot of times, and don't get me wrong, now there's some, there's some fire preachers out here. Our pastor's one of them. These messages they come up with. But you know, if you really couldn't preach, if you just got in the pulpit and got a mic and began to read the Word, that'll preach itself. That's what Bible study is. You're just reading the Word. You ain't got to be a, a, a camp meeting preacher or a general conference preacher to teach a Bible study. The Word will do it. Once you break the ice, it's easy. From there, it's downhill until you see salvation happen. Yeah. I love sitting across the table from somebody in that, that intimate setting, and you just begin to talk about the Lord, and you begin to read the Scripture, and I have them to begin to read the Scripture. I remember sitting at the table one night with a lady, and she began to read about Acts 2.38, and it was almost like I saw a physical light come on in her eyes. It was, she just was taken aback for a minute. She said, wait a minute. This is not what I've heard. You're telling me that there's a different way. Oh, yes, I'm telling No, I'm not telling you. The Bible is. So I need to do this, this, and this. I said, oh, yeah. He said, you'll be, uh, except you be born again by the water and the Spirit. Yeah, you have to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you were baptized in the titles, that's not the way it's done. I know you've probably heard that your whole life. Most of the, the people in this country are going to tell you that you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But that's not what the Scripture says in Acts 2.38. You're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I said the Father is Jesus. The Son is Jesus. The Spirit is Jesus. If you want to be baptized in the titles... 
as long as you're baptized in Jesus' name and you throw the titles out the window, salvation is promised to you. From that moment on, she was wanting to be baptized. She was wanting to read more about Acts 2.38. She wanted to know more about the plan of salvation. I said, there's not a whole lot more to the plan. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's that simple. We make it so much. I, I'll tell you, I was raised a preacher's kid. I literally, my mother went in labor on Sunday night at the church during service. We drove, my dad drove from the church to the hospital. That's all I know. But I didn't receive the Holy Ghost until I was 20 years old. I had this concept in my mind from watching how people would get lost in the Spirit that when I received the Holy Ghost, God was fixing to come in and turn me inside out and upside down and that I wouldn't be able to control myself. It don't happen that way. I don't want to burst your bubble, but that's not the way it happens. I've seen people shout. I've seen them fall out in the Spirit, slain in the Spirit. I've seen them drunk in the Spirit all those years. Didn't happen for me that way. <laughs> I was baptized in the river. Two weeks later, I was driving down the road praying and began to speak in tongues. I was expecting something supernatural, something that was, you know, I was expecting that outer body experience that looked like people were having. It didn't happen for me that way. If it did for you, then praise God, enjoy it. But we have to teach people because they're concepts that are in their mind of things that they've been told over, 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 over. We can't go in there and bombard them with truth. We got to let the Word speak to them. Oh, yeah, I can go in there. No, you're not saved. You're going to hell because you hadn't been baptized in Jesus' name. You'd never see him again. This lady that was on that screen right there, Jeannie, she had smoked for 30 years, received the gift of the Holy Ghost with evidence, speaking in a tongue. I've seen God use her in the gift of healing in the church and walk outside and light a cigarette. I can tell you, show you people right now, will tell you that's a lie that God don't use people like that. I won't tell them they're a lie because I've seen it. And I can take you to the people that experienced it. We receive the Holy Ghost from the inside. The Scripture says the Holy Ghost, the, the, the Spirit of God will clean you up. It's not my job to go tell her what she's doing right or wrong. I'm not judging her. That's God's job. He will work on that. And let me tell you, just by that scenario right there, her daughter that received the Holy Ghost right after her, Nobody ever taught a Bible study or mentioned hair, dress, anything to her. She came to church the next service in a dress. She went to the pastor and she said, I got to tell you something. I was getting ready for church and I just could not put my jeans on. Nobody said nothing. Now I know we can get all lost in standards and we can get all, we can go down that rabbit hole. But if you let the Spirit of God and the love of God work on those people that you're reaching for, you don't have to teach them nothing. God will do the work Himself. All we got to do is be, the, be the, the liaison to lead them right to that Scripture, lead them right to that Word, lead them right to that, that Spirit. That's what our job is. And let God take care of the rest. Knowing the will of God. Loving people, that should be one, two, and three. And then teaching Bible studies. Faith, 25 churches will be planted, and I'm going to be a part of that. You're going to be a part of that. I'm claiming that in Jesus' name. These are some keys that will get us there. So when you see somebody tomorrow, tell them you love them. If they really want to know you love them, they'll, they'll check you. They'll check you and show them. It's real simple, show them up. You know, you can love people and be yourself. You don't have to go overboard and, and make some huge expression and try to be something you're not. Because I don't do good with that. I've watched Brother Arch over the last 10 years that I've known him. He's so calm, cool, collected. His voice is so soft-spoken, and he just shows people he loves them. I've tried to do that, and my daughter said, well, you shouldn't have said that that way. Well, I just said it like Brother Arch would say it. No, you didn't. So I said, you know what? I just need to do what I do. 
let Brother Arch do what he does and let God do the rest. Thank you for listening. Why don't you stand together and give God praise for that word that we heard tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have filled us with your spirit and you've given us power to be witnesses, every one of us. Collectively, we'll work together, but individually, we will meet people that only we will meet. God, let us be witnesses for you. God, let us love people. Let us, let us teach Bible studies. Lord, let there be a harvest, a, uh, just a revival of Bible study teachers in this church. God, I give you praise for that. I give you honor for it in Jesus' name. Come on, give God praise. Thank you, Lord. If you're wondering, you can teach a Bible study. One man I know received a Bible study from Morel Cornwell. And when Brother Cornwell came back the second time, he said, hey, this is an odd request, but would you teach me that first lesson again? And so he did and went, went on for, for a few more Bible studies. And he said, uh, you know, you asked me to teach that first lesson twice once. Why? He said, well, it was so impactful and I, I thought I need to start teaching this, but I wasn't paying enough attention the first time. And so I wanted you to teach it again. And then he started teaching Bible studies. He had one Bible study and he started teaching Bible studies. Was he qualified? Was he breathing? So we, we put a lot of parameters on what God cannot, can and cannot do. God can use us. God will use us if we understand that he would, we don't have to be perfect to be used. And secondly, we shouldn't get discouraged because we don't see the results that we want to see. I was in a group one time, they were talking about their stats of how many successful Bible studies they taught. And I said, well, that's not, that's no big deal. All, all of my Bible studies are successful. He said, what, wait, 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 what? I mean, everybody that you teach a Bible study to, they come to church, they get the Holy Ghost, they live a holy Godly life, they become faithful, tithe paying members. I said, that's not what I said. I said, every one of my Bible studies are successful because the goal is to plant the seed. What they do with it, then it, it, then it will be up to them and God. But if we plant, somebody's going to water and God will give the increase. And he's going to do that. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Let Brother Jeff know what a great job he did. You can be dismissed in Jesus' name. We'll see you Sunday at 1 o'clock and then 2 o'clock for a great time in the presence of the Lord.